All right, hello, and welcome to the 2021 UNC Water and Health Conference, and thank you for joining our session. Um, my name is Allison Lee, and I'm from the Water Institute at UNC, and I am your room host for today. So before we get started, I have a few announcements to share. First, we have networking events for the day. Join us on Remo later this afternoon to connect with colleagues and sponsors alike. Please note that you will need to register an account on Remo and instructions are posted on the website to help you do so. For our participants around the world who can't make today's live sessions, join us tomorrow morning for a recap of today's events. The Late Early Show is back this year to air live with participants in different time zones. Tomorrow's session will discuss how to apply today's lessons to the South Asia region. The session is being recorded for folks who cannot attend the live session and you'll find that the chat feature on Zoom is disabled. Please direct all questions and comments to the chat tab on Pathable. This chat will save all comments for viewers watching the recording of the session, which will be helpful for participants in different time zones. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors. We would not be able to do this event without your support. And in particular, we would like to thank the sponsors for this session the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Comonics, and World Vision. Now that we have... Allison, oh. I see in the chat that everyone's still locked out. Um, oh. So it says only speakers can join and also maybe before here now, but it looks like it's maybe just us and one more person as of right now. Let's try Sorry. this. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized. Yes, no, I was just following up on that. Thank you. Warner, did you let people in? Yep. Now it's open. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the difficulties in getting in, but we're glad to have you guys here. Um, I will get started with some of the announcements again. Um, okay, um, apologies for the delay in getting everyone in, but we're happy to have you guys. And um, we're gonna go over some announcements really quickly um, before we get started with the presentations. So. Welcome to the 2021 UNC Water and Health Conference, and thank you for joining our session. Um, my name is Allison, and I'm with the Water Institute, um, and I will be your host for today. Before we get started, um, we want to share some events going on. So first, we have networking events for the day. Join us on Remo this afternoon to connect with colleagues and sponsors alike. Please note that you will need to register um, for an account on Remo, but instructions are posted on our website. Then join us tomorrow morning for a recap of the day's events with the late early show. So Drs. McCullough and Salzburg will share their thoughts on how to apply today's lessons to the South Asia region. Um, as you guys have found, I believe the chat tab on Pathable, please use that tab to direct your questions um, for today as the Zoom chat is disabled. This will save um, your, this will save the chat for viewers who watch this recording later. And finally, we would like to thank today's sponsors, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Comonix, and World Vision for making this event. So without further ado, uh, we have some exciting presentations lined up today, um, and we will get started with Elijah. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and Elijah, the floor is yours. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about water insecurity experiences and psychological distress among impoverished Ghanaian households. First off, I want to start with a definition of experiential household water insecurity. So this is defined as a condition when affordability, reliability, adequacy, and or safety is significantly reduced or unattainable so as to threaten or jeopardize well-being. This includes both physical and mental health, as well as the capacity to undertake necessary productive, social and cultural activities. And now some background on the topic at hand. Water insecurity has been linked with emotional and psychological distress and qualitative studies such as the one cited below 
that investigated the link between coping with variability and interruptions to water supply and access, as well as quantitative studies that have used locally and cross-culturally validated measures of water insecurity. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the quantitative measure of water insecurity that we used in this study. But what's important to know is that now we're able to measure this so we can you know, link it to health and psychosocial outcomes. And some background on the data I'll be talking about today. From 2011 to 2013, households from two regions of Ghana, and I'll describe those regions in more detail later, were previously enrolled in the graduating the ultra poor randomized controlled trial. This is a large RCT that spans six countries. And the reason I'm talking about it to you today is that in 2019, households from those two regions of Ghana were followed up and they completed the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel Survey Questionnaire. This is the first time that the household water insecurity experiences scale, which I'll talk more about later, was included with this panel survey. Now, this wasn't nationally representative data, but in the future, ongoing rounds of panel survey data collection will include the HY scale across all of Ghana. But today, I'm just specifically talking about this subsample of household heads, household heads from these two regions in Ghana. So some more information on the sample population. So these are cross-sectional data from rural household heads from Ghana's northern region in the blue with a sample size of 2,973 and the upper east region and the orange with a sample size of 855. And those colors will correspond to the regions throughout the presentation. So some background on the ecology and climate of these regions. Both are in the savanna climate zone and experience high temperatures, low rainfall variability, sorry, low annual rainfall, but high rainfall variability as well as recurrent flooding. And they experience these uh, at a higher rate in comparison to the more southern regions of Ghana due to being in the savanna climate zone. So in general, they're experiencing these threats to water and water insecurity associated with climate change. And some background specifically on the water access situation in the rural northern and upper east regions. These aren't data that I was analyzing in this subsample. These came from a previous wave of the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel Survey. First up, we're looking at average distance between water source and household. And we see that for both drinking and general use water, on average, there's a longer distance traveled in the northern region in comparison to the upper east region to fetch drinking and general use water. And we see a similar story when we look at average time spent on a round trip to fetch water. The difference is smaller, but again, in the northern region, people are spending more time to fetch water in comparison to those in the rural upper east region. And now to look specifically at data from the subsample analyzed in this presentation. We were able to kind of approximate the JMP drinking water ladder. We didn't have enough data to look at whether, there, whether someone had an improved water source, but we were able to get at basic and limited in the blue and unimproved or surface water in the orange and lighter orange. We see on the left for the northern region, there's a large proportion of respondents who reported surface water as their primary drinking water source. But this wasn't the case in the upper east region where the majority report a limited drinking water source. So in general from this, we might expect whenever we're thinking about drinking water quality uh, that in the northern region, there may be more experiences of water insecurity related to quality. So that's interesting to keep in the back of our mind as we go and look at the water and security data in a moment. So the research objectives uh, for this presentation are to describe the prevalence of water and security experiences and psychological distress, and then to test the association between the two. So the measure of psychological distress that we used was the Kessler 10 scale. This is what's included in the Ghana Socioeconomic Panel Survey. It asked about an individual's anxiety and depressive symptoms in the past four weeks. Scores range 10 to 50, and scores greater than or equal to 22 are dichotomized as distressed. And our measure of water insecurity, the HY scale, or the household water insecurity experiences scale. It's a 12 item scale that measures experiences of household water insecurity in the past four weeks, experiences such as worrying around water. Did you have interruptions to your water supply? Uh, did you lose sleep over issues with your water situation? Scores range zero to 36 and scores greater than or equal to 12 are dichotomized as water insecure. And both distress and water insecurity are treated as dichotomized variables in this analysis. 
So first up to look at descriptive statistics, we're looking at the prevalence of household water insecurity. Again, that's an HY score greater than or equal to 12. We see that the prevalence is higher in the Northern region in the blue at around 40% and lower in the Upper East region at around 17%. And now looking at the prevalence of psychological distress, we see a different story. It's higher in the Upper East region at around 70% but lower in the northern region. And keep in mind that there's a larger sample size in the northern region, as I mentioned before. And now looking at the association between the two, these are the adjusted odds ratios stratified by region uh, of distress associated with household water insecurity. So for the upper east region in the orange, we see that there's no association between distress uh, among those who reported household water insecurity. But that's not the same story in the northern region in the blue. We see that there's 2.37 times the odds of reporting psychological distress among those who also reported household water insecurity. And this is interesting to think about. Why would we see uh, no association in the Upper East, but we're seeing this association with higher distress in the northern region? And I think now it's useful to take a step back and look more deeply at the descriptive data to think about the prevalences of the exposure and the outcome to try to understand what's going on here. So what we're looking at here on the y-axis is the prevalence of distress. And on the x-axis is whether what, when was water secure or water insecure. And first, we're just looking at data from the northern region. And we see that among those reporting water insecurity, there was a higher prevalence of distress, above 50%, but a lower prevalence of distress among those who were water secure. And now looking at the upper east region, uh, this is in the red, we see that there's no difference in the prevalence of distress between whether one was water secure or from a water insecure household. And lastly, take note of the size of the spheres. We see that in the northern region in the blue, the spheres are similar sizes. That's because there was a similar amount exposed to water security as there was to water insecurity. About 40% were water insecure in the northern region. But you can see in the Upper East region, a very small amount of people were exposed to water insecurity. The majority were water secure. Um, so that kind of helps us maybe think about why we're not seeing a relationship with distress in the Upper East. It's just higher in general. There's a higher prevalence of distress, but there's no difference between water security or insecurity. So in conclusion, a disparity existed between the Upper East and Northern regions regarding psychological distress. But experiences of water insecurity, given its low prevalence in the Upper East region, is not making a large contribution to that disparity. So future research should aim to understand the where, when, and how in which experiences of water insecurity undermine mental health. And this requires us to think beyond just the individual level or the household level, but I think what uh, the results of this analysis are suggesting is that we need to think about how community prevalences of water insecurity can relate to individual experiences. So you can imagine in a community where water insecurity is very common, uh, the stressors an individual might experience may be different. Perhaps they feel a higher burden of needing to share water with their neighbors or their family because their community members are also water insecure and that could be perhaps distressing. But the relationship between water insecurity and distress may be quite different if you're the only household that's water insecure in your community. You might perceive a higher um, emotion of unfairness or something like that. And I forgot to link this study or to cite it here, but uh, Amber Woodich and Alex Bruce have done some really great work exactly on these pathways, thinking about unfairness, uh, as well as um, water sharing as potential you know, mechanisms for these distress pathways. And I can link that uh, in the chat after this. And I'd like to thank our collaborators at Northwestern University from the Department of Economics, uh, specifically the Global, Global Poverty Research Lab, as well as Innovations for Poverty Action, which coordinated and ran the large uh, RCT that I mentioned these participants participated in about 10 years back. Thank you, and I'll now take your questions. Thank you, Elijah, for your presentation. If anyone has any questions, um, please put them in the chat tag on Passable. As I'm people, having trouble seeing the chat, uh, so if you could maybe read yes, uh, the I questions will be reading for me. Them I've, for you. I've lost my uh, Zoom screen as well, but I'll do my best. No worries, it's difficult to see both sometimes, but I'll be able to read them for you. 
Um, as people may be typing them in, I'll get us started with a question. Um, how would you describe the socioeconomic demographics of the studied regions? Thank you for that question. So the thing that's interesting, particularly about this subsample is that it, it wasn't like a regional representative across the regions of the Upper East or the Northern region. These were particularly among very poor households that were identified to participate in the randomized controlled trial. So we're not really able to say something about psychological distress and water insecurity, perhaps among the general population in the rural Upper East or the rural um, northern regions, but this is particularly among uh, very impoverished households. So um, it might be that those are experiencing higher water insecurity because of their economic situation, but they also could be experiencing more experiences of water insecurity uh, associated with, uh, you know, having high poverty and lower socioeconomic status. But differences between the two, um, I wouldn't be able to describe as much except that um, they were both, you know, these were identified as the most poor among these communities to participate in the RCT. Okay, thank you. If anyone has additional questions, feel free to add them to the chat tab on Pathable. Um, another question I have is, uh, did this study include or consider quantities or quality of water? No, we didn't have data on qualities or quantity of water. We were able to kind of approximate that drinking water quality based off of self-reported drinking water source, but there wasn't information on amounts of water used. There was some information on the amount spent on water, um, but it was kind of, it wasn't very specific data. Um, so no, we didn't have amounts, which would be nice. But one thing I think that will be uh, interesting to look for in the future is that um, having the nationally representative data uh, will allow us to not just look at these two regions, but see how it varies across the country. Not to say that we need to you know, average across all the regions and not pay attention to these important differences, um, but I think we'll be able to look at a lot more uh, factors. We have a couple minutes left of Q&A. We have one question. Um, from Fulia Amevor uh, asking, did you work with local researchers during the trial? Uh, I should have uh, been more clear about this. We were not involved with the randomized, my study team at Northwestern was not involved with the um, randomized control trial that went on 10 years ago. Uh, that was what, with Innovations for Poverty Action. Uh, several universities collaborated on that study. This was particularly um, looking at HY's data from the follow-up. So we, there were local researchers that worked and local NGOs that collaborated on that RCT whenever it occurred. Um, and also something else I noted, should have noted is that I went back and looked to see whether someone was in a control arm or uh, in the, the treatment arm for the RCT, whether that had differences now in distress or water insecurity. And there weren't any that were apparent. Um, since it was so far in the past, I think we were kind of safe to say that it wasn't. Um, seeing an effect of the RCT on the results we were looking at today. Great, now we have time for one more question. If you have additional questions, please feel free to add them to the chat tab on Pathable and Elijah can respond to them afterwards. Um, but for our last question, Darcy Anderson is asking, to what extent do you think water insecurity and stress interact with sanitation and hygiene related insecurity and stress? Thank you for that question, Darcy. Um, and the HY scale, and if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, Dr. Sarah Young will be um, doing another presentation on the HY scale tomorrow. Um, but the HY scale actually asks questions about sanitation and hygiene. Um, one in particular, uh, did you, were you not able to wash your clothes uh, in the past month due to issues with water? Um, or did you experience shame because of issues with water, which could be perhaps because of um, feeling feelings of shame because of uh, uncleanliness associated with water insecurity or perhaps not having enough water or clean water to offer guests who are coming to your house. So it does get at some of those constructs around uh, sanitation and hygiene within the scale. But I definitely think that that is one of the key domains for water insecurity experiences relating to distress. Thank you, Elijah. Um, you have a couple more questions that you can respond to on the chat tab on Pathable, um, but we will now move on to our next presenter. 
So Francisca, please share your screen and begin your presentation. So thank you very much for joining the presentation of our work on the evaluation of groundwater self-supply safety and associated risk factors for fecal contamination in urban Indonesia. This work forms part of my PhD and part of a larger Water for Women funded project, which is a collaboration between University of Technology Sydney and Universitas of Indonesia. And because of the different time zones, Gita from University University of Indonesia and I recorded the presentation. Hello, my name is Gita from Universitas Indonesia and I will present the first part of the presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, we will start with definition of self-supply. Self-supply, uh, commonly refers to an on-premises water sources, usually relying on groundwater or rainwater that is privately owned, invested in, and maintained by individual households. In Indonesia, uh, 41 million people in urban Indonesia rely on self-supply. Self-supply has the potential to provide a safely managed water services because it's accessible on-premises, but little is known uh, to, ex uh, to what extent it is free from contamination. Therefore, this study aims to address two research questions. First, to what extent is groundwater cell supply free from fecal contamination at source and at point of use? Second, what are the risk factors of fecal contamination in cell supply at source and point of use? Next slide, please. This study took place uh, in two densely populated cities in Indonesia, Bekasi and Metro. Bekasi is located in West Java on the eastern border of Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, while Metro is a city in the um, in Indonesia, Indonesian province of Lampung on Sumatra Island. This study includes three subdistricts from Bekasi and five subdistricts from Metro. Uh, and those sub-districts were selected based on the widespread of self-supply, the high level of population density, and high level of poverty. Next slide, please. And when we look to wealth distribution, uh, we can see that uh, the households in metro, on average, are poorer than the wider urban population in Indonesia, while average wealth status of household in Bukasi is similar to the national number. And both cities had narrower wealth distribution than other national Indonesia number. Next slide, please. We uh, conducted data collection by household surface, sanitary inspection, and water quality testing. We collected data from about 300 uh, randomly selected households in each city, Bekasi and Metro, uh, during wet season in Bekasi and during dry season in Metro. Uh, the household survey covered a range of themes about the household on health and socioeconomic status, where management and decision making, for the source use, and potential on site risk. And the household survey questionnaire also included sanitary inspection module uh, to observe the sanitary infra sanitation infrastructure, water supply infrastructure, and it's adapted from the WHO sanitary inspection. Uh, water samples were collected uh, from 240 and 296 uh, households in Bekasi and Metro, respectively. And of these households, 222 and 271 samples were collected from self supply sources, and 79 and 92 from household drinking water point of use. After we collected the sample, um, the, the water sample was con the E. coli was quantified using IDEX Qualier 18 and using IDEX 23 2000 system. Next slide, please. To understand the risk of fecal contamination of cell supply, contamination predictors were categorized in hazard factors, pathway factors, and indirect factors. Hazard factors at source include 
pollution sources uh, such as sanitation system um, and presence of animals uh, feces and meanwhile at the point of use uh, the hazard factor include E. coli concentration of the water source. Uh, by the way, factors allow microbial pollution to enter the groundwater supply and at the source it includes well protection and infrastructure at the source. Uh, while at the point of use, adware factors include transport, treatment, and storage of drinking water. And to examine the influence of different risk factors at source and point of use, crude and adjusted odds ratio were calculated based on univariate and multivariate analysis. And now, uh, Francisca will continue the presentation. Thank you, Gita. I'm happy to present the results now. Results show that self-supply was commonly contaminated with E. coli at source, but significant less contamination was detected at the point of use. Households commonly reported to boil their self-supplied water. In the Kasi, E. coli was detected in 60% of all self-supply sources and in 29% of all self-supply samples at point of use. Similarly, in Metro, E. coli was present in 72% of all self-supply sources and 32% of all self-supply samples at point of use. Unimproved sources such as unprotected wells were more likely to be contaminated than improved sources such as boreholes and protected wells. Next slide, please. Self-supply of poor household was more frequently contaminated than that of wealthier households in Metro. There was a statistically significant correlation between wealth and water quality in Metro, but not in the Kasi. In Metro, the level of contamination was highest in samples from self-supply sources of the poorest household categorized in wealth quintile 1, with 50% of samples from households showing E. coli contamination greater than 100 MPN. Next slide, please. Results from the univariate analysis showed that significant risk factors for self-supply water quality are well typed, with unprotected dug wells being at higher risk of contamination than boreholes for both study sites. Borehole depth for high level of contamination in the Kasi and valve in Metro. In Metro, water lifted from dug wells with a rope and bucket was significantly more frequently contaminated than with a pump. Despite widespread and effective boiling practice in the Kasi, contaminated source water still had a significant influence on water quality at the point of use. Next slide, please. Multivariate analysis was carried out considering all self-supply source types and for boreholes and dug wells separately. As in the univariate analysis, well type was a significant risk factor with unprotected dug wells being at higher risk compared to boreholes in the Kasi and Metro. Wealth was still a significant determinant for high levels of contamination in Metro when holding constant other factors. Shallower boreholes and the absence of a concrete platform were associated with more frequent contamination of greater than 100 NPN. No significant predictors for fecal contamination were found when only dug wells were considered in the multivariate analysis. As in the univariate analysis, contaminated source water was still associated with water quality at the point of use. Considered hazard factors such as sanitation systems and animals did not have a significant association with water quality. Self-supply sources in Metro and Bekasi were commonly contaminated. However, widespread boiling practice improved water quality at point of use. Predictors of fecal contamination included indirect factors and pathway factors and no hazard factors. To increase the safety of self-supply, following recommendations can be concluded from the study. Financial support to invest in better self-supply infrastructure, such as the replacement of rope and bucket with pump, could reduce fecal contamination. This is especially true in Metro, where many households rely on unprotected dug wells and where the poorest households are at high risk of fecal contamination. Education about water quality needs to be provided to households to raise awareness regarding proper water treatment and storage. 
This is especially true in the Kasi, where despite water treatment, Zeus water quality was still related to water quality at the point of use. The study showed that Zeus water quality of self-supply does not necessarily provide information about the water that households actually consume. Therefore, monitoring of self-supply water quality is only necessary is not only necessarily at source, but also at the point of use. However, recommendations must be weighted against other strategies, such as, for example, investing in public pipe systems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francesca, for that great presentation. Um, if anyone has questions for her, please put them into the chat tab on top of them. We have one question from Andrew Armstrong asking, um, interesting that water quality was consistently better at point of use than source. What sort of HWTS practices were being used in Bakasi and Metro? Uh, households commonly reported to boil their water so it was the treatment was water boiling. Yeah, almost all households reported the boil and yeah. So boiling was the common method. Thank you. And thank you, Angie, for your question. Um, please feel free to add your questions to the chat tab on Pathable. In the meantime, um, you, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that financial support helps improve self-supply infrastructure and could you know, reduce fecal contamination. Um, do you know how accessible, uh, yeah, do you know how accessible pump replacements are in this area? Sorry, how uh, pump replacement, how? how? Yeah, and, how accessible it is to replace oh. the rope and bucket with the pumps that you're mentioning. Um, so whether it's feasible or what? It, so I don't understand. The... Oh, sorry. Uh, how financially feasible it is right now? Ah, without... fe yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, I I don't know, but it needs to be also weighed up whether like the support in self-supply or the support in public pipe systems, whether, which is more like, yeah, it needs to be weighed up, which is like better. And I mean, I don't know um, like the feasibility of to support it, yeah, the, the finance support, but I think um, it's about, yeah, no, I don't know, it's about, um, I mean, NGOs or government, when you can, yeah, I don't know, I don't know about the feasibility, but I think it should be somehow possible to, yeah, to invest in better self-supply structure. Yeah. That's but great. it needs to be weighed up whether it's better to invest like in public self-supply, but there is also the thing whether households really trust the public pipe systems and whether they have yeah, their preferences. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> um, a question, oh, yes. We have a question from Donald John. Uh, why do you think wealth is a predictor of water quality in your statistical analysis? I missed how you differed this, or how you how this differed between at home and point of view. So I did multivariate analysis where I considered several predictors like wealth, and I calculated wealth based on also the wealth index from DHS, and then I considered other factors such as the protection of well unprotected and yeah unprotected and protected wells or boreholes, and then also san sanitation systems, the proximity to sanitation systems and number of sanitation and also animals. And then in metro wells are still a significant determinant 
um, even when holding constant the other factors. So this means that wealth um, is a predictor, but the question is now whether um, we missed some other factors, which are like, um, yeah, other factors which correlate with wealth or whether wealthier households really have like, um, or, or wealth is associated with sanitary, um, sanitary things like, for example, the wealthier households have um, used more frequently pumps than and poor houses more frequently rope and bucket. So this is still a little bit the question why wealth is a predictor of water quality. So yeah, maybe it's that we missed other factors or it is really an indicator of sanitary. Um, yeah, so yeah. It, but it was based on multivariate analysis when considering other, other factors. Um, sadly, our time is up for Q&A. We need to move on to our next speaker. But Francisca, you do have one more question in the chat tab on Pathable. Um, if anyone else has further questions, feel free to add them there and they will be responded to shortly. Um, so thank you, Francisca. And now we'll move on to thank our you. next presenter. Our next presenter is Donald John McAllister with the British Geological Survey. So Donald, whenever you're ready, please share your screen and please begin your presentation. Thank you. Um, so today I'm just going to present um, a couple of projects that we've been working on looking at the functionality and resilience of hand pump boreholes in sub-Saharan Africa. And I just want to acknowledge all of our collaborators and co-authors, but particularly those in Ethiopia, Uganda and Malawi, where we did all this work. So why are we still talking about hand pumps in the era of the SDGs? Well, firstly, as many as 184 million people continue to rely on hand pumps. And we know from the latest GMP estimates that 34% of people um, rely on basic water supplies, and many of those will be hand pumps, but that many people continue to live in surf rely on surface water and improved and limited uh, water supplies. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so yeah, in the transition, hand pumps are going to continue to be very important as we transition to safely manage water supplies. However, we also know from evidence from as early as the 1970s that functionality of hand pump boreholes is an ongoing issue and up to 40% of hand pump boreholes can be non-functional at any one time. Um, the benefits of improved access to water are lost as a result of non-functionality and non-functionality impacts community resilience to hazards and drought. And that's where I want to start the presentation today. So in 2015 and 2016, Ethiopia suffered a severe drought, leaving 10 million people relying on aid. So we worked with UNICEF and the University of Addis Ababa um, on a data set that had been collected by UNICEF during the drought, where they monitored 5,000 individual water points every week for 12 weeks. But we also collected data from um, 50 water points where we collected water levels and thermotolerant chloroforms. And this first slide shows um, the data from the large data set that, that UNICEF collected. And what you can see here is that hand pump borehole functionality was highest overall. Motorized borehole functionality was lowest overall. Um, and the other sources had more um, variations in functionality through the period of the drought. But not only was hand pump borehole functionality um, greater. Uh, sorry, I don't know why that's doing that. Um, but I'll carry on. Um, not only was it greater, it also increased at a more uh, significant rate than the other um, than the other sources. Um, um, so hand pump borehole functionality increased rapidly. Motorized borehole functionality increased at a more slow rate. So hand pumps were really crucial um, for rural communities during the drought. So then, when we looked at the water level data. Um, from inside the hand pump boreholes from the hand dug wells in the springs. Um, 
We find that hand pump boreholes also recovered most quickly. So generally they recovered within one to two hours after the cessation of pumping, for example, at the end of the day. Um, hand dug wells and springs took longer to recover. Um, and uh, they took up to 10 hours. And in some cases they took up to 30 hours. Um, we then looked at the thermal tolerant coliforms and we find that overall hand pump boreholes had the best water quality um, uh, of all the water sources as well. I apologize about that, that pointer. I, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so this is going back to the large data set again. We've talked about the increases in, in functionality of the hand pump boreholes, but we also looked at access and whether communities had, uh, had a perception of enough water. Um, and we found that generally hand pumps were the most accessible, so people were traveling for the least amount of time, um, and they were also collecting adequate amounts of water. Um, and that was in stark contrast to the other sources. For example, you can see with the motorized boreholes here um, that people generally were reporting less, um, uh, collecting less water and taking longer to collect that water. So in summary, Hand pumps were really a crucial source of rural water supply um, for, uh, for um, rural communities. Um, if you just bear with me, I think I know why it's doing that and I'll just stop it. Um, sorry, I'm really, I, I must apologize for this. Uh, there we go, so I'll carry on. Um, so yeah, so, but so hand pump boreholes were really important, um, but we also had this issue with low functionality at the onset of the drought. And we know that there has been this issue, as I mentioned previously. So in the next part of the talk, I really want to talk about um, this poor functionality and some of the work we've been doing in this area. So as part of the Hidden Crisis Project, which was a large project as part of um, the, uh, a programme called UPRO in the UK, um, we looked at... Um, funded by the UK, we looked at 600 hand pump boreholes in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Malawi. And we looked at the status of these boreholes in terms of their functionality. And to do that, we defined uh, functionality using this, this definition here. So we had six categories of functionality, um, and those were with reference to uh, the quantity of water relative to the design yield of the hand pump, and then uh, the amount of downtime that hand pumps had in the past year. So we applied that to those 600 hand pumps. This is an example of the results from Ethiopia. So we found that about 45% of the boreholes that we visited in Ethiopia were fully functional, um, but many of them had uh, issues with um, reliability or uh, inadequate water quantity. And that compares to about 80% in the national statistics. Um, but then in the national statistics, they only use a binary definition of, um, of uh, functionality. So we were moving away from that in this study. But then what we also did was we went back to many of these sites, 150 of them, and we systematically dismantled them to try and understand what are the underlying reasons for these functionality outcomes. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, in, in three broad categories of physical factors that determined the, the functionality outcomes. So the first is hydrogeology. Um, and you can see uh, in Ethiopia, for example, that the water level has a clear relationship with the functionality categories. So functionality, uh, so, sorry, water level in the, the functional category is most shallow and it gets gradually deeper through the low yield, poor liability and non-functional categories. And in Ethiopia, many of the sites also exceeded the maximum pumping depths of the pumps that were in use. The pattern was less obvious in Malawi and Uganda, but we then also looked at transmissivity or aquifer yield and we found similar patterns. Um, in Ethiopia, transmissivity was an order of magnitude larger in the functional categories than it was in the other categories and gradually decreased through those categories um, with the lowest transmissivities in the non-functional category. And we find similar patterns in both Malawi and Uganda. But in Uganda, we find universally low transmissivities. And the black line shows the minimum transmissivity value we would expect for a hand pump to deliver against its design yield. The red line here shows the transmissivity that we might expect for larger systems. So, you know, possibly in the SDG era, we're thinking about moving more towards pipe washer supply that might be supplied by large solar pumps or diesel pumps, possibly. 
Um, and we'd expect we'd, we would need much larger transpassivities from the aquifers to be able to sustain those types of pumps. Um, so there's, an, there's a, a warning here as well for our, the transition during the SDG eras. The next thing we looked at was the borehole construction. And that was with relative to the, uh, with, with respect to the depth and um, to the screen, to the casing um, and the cylinder positioning and how they all relate to each other. And I won't spend too much time on this other, to, other than to point out that in many cases, we found that when we did our pumping test, uh, the water level fell below the, the position of the cylinder. And you can see that that was particularly a case in Uganda where we have these low transpassivities. At more than 50% of functional boreholes, that was a problem. And at 100% of abandoned boreholes, that was a problem. But we also find it to be the case that between 25% and 50% of sites in Malawi, and um, you know, between 10 and 25, 30% of sites in Ethiopia. And the problem with this, of course, is that in the dry season, when people are pumping, uh, there's a much greater risk that you will draw the water below the cylinder and you won't be able to access uh, water. So the next thing we looked at was uh, the condition of components. And we uh, identified a series of issues with the seals, the bearings, um, the rods. Um, those are all fairly well-known uh, issues. But what I want to focus on in this presentation is uh, the rising mains on the India Mark IIs in particular. So we find significant corrosion of the galvanized steel rising mains. Um, in Ethiopia, about 50% of sites, uh, we found rising mains, sorry, 50% of rising mains were corroded. And in Uganda, it was greater than 80% of rising mains. In Uganda, that's partly because of the groundwater, which is very corrosive. But we also identified significant issues with the material quality. So you can see that 60% of rising main wall thicknesses were below the specifications in the design manuals and 55% of galvanizing thicknesses were below design specifications in Ethiopia. But those numbers were 65% and 90% respectively in Uganda. So there's a real issue with poor quality components going into boreholes um, across uh, the, the three countries um, that we were working. And there's other research going on to this, but I think this is a real area that requires further research. Before I wrap up, I just want to talk briefly about um, some analysis we did on the relationship between um, water management arrangements in terms of these four factors and our um, five functionality categories. And in general, we find a very weak statistical um, relationship between um, the strength of the water management arrangements. So in terms of the water management score, um, you can see here, and the functionality categories. Um, and except one exception to that was, um, affordable maintenance repair. So where communities had access to affordable maintenance repair, we generally found high, uh, more functionality. Um, and you can see that the difference between the fully functional category and the other functionality categories here. And that chimes with what I was saying earlier about um, in Ethiopia, where we saw large increases in functionality as a result of this proactive operation and maintenance um, program that uh, was taking place as in, in response to the droughts. So where People have access and it's, uh, you know, are able to access it quickly and affordably. Affordable maintenance repair is obviously crucial. So I just want to wrap up. Um, hand pumps are an essential, safe and resilient form of rural water supply. Um, we looked at different, uh, different physical factors that determine functionality outcomes. Um, and understanding these physical and social characteristics of functionality can ensure continued access to improve water supply for rural communities. It can help improve resilience of rural communities. And also it helps um, increase the likelihood of success of new technologies um, in the SDG era. Thank you. Thank you, Donald John, for your presentation. Um, we have a question for you in the chat tab on Pathable. Reminder that if you have any questions throughout this, feel free to um, add in the chat tab and we will bring it to your attention. But Linda Donald is asking, have you systematically studied the relationship of sanitation to the boreholes and consequent clinical problems such as diarrhea? So we, we haven't done that. Um, when we did our assessments, we, we did basic sanitary surveys, um, which included identifying um, latrines um, and, uh, but we haven't systematically done any 
uh, investigations into how that then affects uh, diarrhea disease. But I believe that there is other um, studies that are that are doing that in more detail. Thank you very much, Smart. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to add them to the chat tab on Fathable. In the meantime, um, I was wondering, do you know when the hand pumps were originally installed, um, the ones studied in the Hidden Crisis Project? Yeah, so um, it was variable. So we had a whole range of um, uh, different ages. Um, so some of them were, were fairly new, some of them were, were much older. Um, and that is something that we have looked at a wee bit um, in our analysis. Um, and I think previous studies have shown that, that that's important and in particular um, in the first year. So um, a lot of previous evidence has shown that uh, there's a high risk of boreholes failing in the first year. Um, but that's not something that um, we've gone into a lot of detail on, um, but it certainly is an issue. Great, thank you. Um, Hank Holtzlag is asking, well, first says, good presentation, I agree. Um, then asking, regarding functionality, did you measure differences between the type of hand pumps? Um, so in this study, we had two different types of hand pumps. We had the AfterDevs and the India Mark IIs. Um, and so, so generally in Malawi, it's AfterDevs. In Uganda, it's India Mark IIs. And in Ethiopia, it's a mix of the two. Um, and primarily in Ethiopia, um, India Mark IIs are increasingly used on, on deep wells. Um, so it's quite hard to do a comparison um, of, of them because the way that, that we originally sampled in the first phase, it was randomly sampled. Um, so in Ethiopia, we had a mix, it, it, was, it was random. So we, you know, we couldn't determine whether it was AfroDevs or India Mark IIs until we went to the, the sites. And then in the second phase, we deliberately selected the sites based on the functionality categories um, that, that, uh, that we'd found in the previous studies. Um, so um, so it's is, it is quite hard to do that comparison. Um, and I mean, I presented some of the results on corrosion and obviously corrosion is much more an issue in the India Mark IIs than it is in the AfroDevs. Um, Ethiopia is an interesting case because um, as I say, the India Mark IIs are used on the deeper wells. And what we have found is that that's generally solving one problem because you have deep groundwater. So that helps you access that more easily, but then it creates another problem because then you have a higher risk of corrosion. Um, and we did see some evidence of, of that happening. Um, but that's about as far as we've gone with that at the moment. But I think it's an area that we can take it a bit further. And then one more question before our time wraps up. Um, there's a question asking, does ownership, private or government of the pump slash borehole play a role in functionality? So that, again, that's not something that, that we've looked at, um, but I suspect that, that it does. Um, the pumps that we were using were all, sorry, that we were examining were all community managed hand pumps. And you know the, the better presented at the end there was done in partnership with social science colleagues from the University of Sheffield. Um, and as I say, we find quite a weak statistical relationship between the strength of the management arrangement. And, you know, I, I think we have shown, I think that affordable maintenance repair is key, both in the study in the drought in Ethiopia and in the work that was done um, in those three countries. And I think other studies have shown this as well. And I think, no matter, you know, you got to get the management model right and then, but then once you have the affordable maintenance repair, once you have the ability for communities to access that, I think that makes a big, big difference um, to functionality outcomes. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, a big thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, you guys presented some incredible and very exciting work. And thank you to everyone for coming out support and listen and engage in these presentations. Um, the recordings of this presentation will be posted online. And if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to message any of our presenters on Packable um, to connect with them more. Um, Donald John, if you stop sharing screen, I'm gonna share and go back to um, go back to 
announcements. So just some recap on announcements for today, um, the rest of today. We do have, well, shortly after this event, we have uh, poster sessions that you can sign on to as well. And then we have networking sessions in the afternoon on Remo, so feel free to join for that. Um, we'd have the late early show later tonight. If this is not in your live time zone, you can watch a live session in a time that's more fitting to you. Um, thank you guys for using the chat tab on Packable. We really appreciate all of your questions and comments and please feel free to uh, continue and um, engage in the conversations after that. And yeah, thank you to our sponsors and thank you all of you for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That's all we have for today. So thank you guys all for coming. <laughs>